Hello and welcome to the CS2 Plus C show. Thank you very much for liking and subscribing. And of course, a big shout out to our partners at Betway. Check out betway.co.za for all the information on the upcoming Betway SA20. We'll be giving away tickets. All you need to do is like and subscribe. Follow us on our social media handles. Um, but yeah, today with just a couple of days to go until Christmas, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome a legend of motocross in South Africa, 10-time champion. Karim, is that right? 10-time national champion motocross? Yes, yes, 10 times. Not 20. Not 20. I'm not that old. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look that old, my man. But 10-time, uh, and then last, or this year, enduro champion too? Uh, cross-country. Cross-country cross country champion? Country, yeah. You're going to have to educate me on the enduro, cross-country. Yeah. I know what motocross is. Yeah. So. yeah. But um, it is Monday, so forgive me. <laughs> Yeah, but thanks for coming in. No, bud. thank you. Um, you found the studio okay, right? Yeah, yeah. My navigation training has been paying off. It's, okay, so uh, then you'll be fine for Dakar. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I need to come to the studio a few more times. <laughs> well, in case you don't know, um, and you've been living under a rock for the last couple of months, Karen Fitzgerald, he is a legend of motocross. Uh, he's been involved in the cross country. He's been on a bike since he what, four years old, right? Four years old, yeah. Um, probably even before that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually didn't want to race at all before that. Uh, really? Yeah, I didn't want to touch a bike. And my parents actually bought me a bike for my probably third birthday. Okay. Um, and I wanted nothing to do with it. Little 50? Or? Yeah, PW50, a brand new one. My brother didn't, <laughs> he didn't have anything and I had a brand new bike. Um, <laughs> but I used to start it in the house, rev it, smoke the house out and then... That was it. That was it. That was my fix. <laughs> <laughs> so what convinced you? I mean, I, I don't know. My brother was racing at the time. Um, and obviously going to the track every weekend, it was my life. And eventually I thought it would be fun to ride a bike. And I started riding and yeah. And then I had my first race, I think when I was four years old. So a lot happened in those 12 months. A after lot, just a lot. smoking out there. <laughs> <laughs> a lot, a lot happened. Yeah. But um, yeah, I've been at the track ever since. I was think I was born at the track. We were actually looking at some photos the other day at the house and I was in my nappy on top of a bike, washing the bike and um, yeah, here we are now. That's awesome. Um, so I imagine <clears throat> the rest, as they say, is history now. Yep. It's taken you all over the world. A motocross, um, it's just part of your, who you are now, right? Yeah, I mean, flip. Everywhere, everywhere I've gone has basically been because of racing a bike. Um, and we were actually in the dunes the other day and I was thinking to myself, geez, I'd never have been here if it wasn't for bikes. I don't know where I'd be or yeah. what I'd be doing. Um, and yeah, it is part of part of life. There's a guy, um, Neville Bradshaw. If there's one guy that loves riding a bike and proof as to riding bikes or even if it's not bikes, whatever you do, I mean, if it's been part of your life for so long, it's uh, so hard to get rid of yeah. or leave or stop. It's yeah, impossible. So if you have a choice, right, you've got to go and get your wife a uh, <laughs> loaf of bread and milk, you know, uh, from the <laughs> shop. There you've got four wheels or two wheels. No, 100% I'm taking the bike. <laughs> Absolutely. That's not even a discussion, yeah, right? I'll go back for the milk and the bread. And <laughs> <laughs> um. I'm fascinated to learn about your next chapter. Obviously, the motocross is, you know, that was an illustrious career. You traveled the world, national titles, competing in Canada, all these different places. Now it's Dakar. Um, you let me know on another interview I did with you recently that you spent a week sort of observing yep. this last Dakar 2023. Was that when your mind was already made up or were you still like... Okay, let's sort of see how we go about this. No, it's been, I would say, a year and a half basically from now. Obviously, okay. leading up to to going to watch the last week of Dakar, um, it was a bit of a hum and a ha, and are we going to do it? Are we not going to do it? It's uh, not the cheapest thing to kind of do, yeah. um, especially the way our Rand and Euro goes at the moment. So <laughs> it's... <laughs> For those it was, who don't know, Rand, 20 Rand to 1 Euro. Yep. Yeah, so we're not in a good position, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, and when it's uh, 100 plus thousand euros, it adds up quickly. So we eventually made the call and uh, went with Daryl Curtis to to watch the last last week of Dakar this year, um, which was really cool. And yeah, I kind of 100% made up my mind when I was there. It was, 
uh, something I wanted to really be involved in, and we were a couple of weeks out from from starting. I, I, I'm dying to know, like, when you were standing there, was it like, okay, let's get on a bike, let's do this, you know what I mean? Because I, I imagine it's seeing it is one thing, yeah. but when you're on the starting line, knowing that firstly you've got to navigate the desert, you've got to find where you've got to go, and you're doing it at a pretty good speed, um, it's all encompassing. Yeah, <clears throat> and that's what makes it pretty cool, like the new challenge. Obviously, racing motocross, I've gone to tracks, the same tracks many times, um, raced the same tracks for years and years and years, and the riding actually becomes very second nature. You go there and you can kind of, I mean, if you go to the shops and, and get bread and milk, like you say, your mind switches off, you can think about all kinds of things, and you get to the shop and you're like, how did I get you? Yeah. Exactly the same thing sometimes with the racing, obviously in a different aspect, like everything comes a lot na more natural. And uh, with the rally bike, it, doing, having, having the navigation kind of adds that extra bit of uh, difficulty to it. Yeah. And, and now riding still comes somewhat second nature, but now you've got the difficulty of navigating and watching the road and making sure you're not jumping off dunes and and ending up where you're not supposed to be. And, and it's a, a really difficult version of riding a bike. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm busy. Look, yeah, I've just opened up the, the Dakar website. I mean, there's no big New Year's for you. <laughs> <laughs> there really isn't. Because um, it's all down to business. And and I mean, we've we've uh, had Kirsten Lantman on the show. We've had Hank Latakhan uh, on um the Malimoto side is insane. Crazy. It's something else. I mean, it's tough enough just taking on this route. hundred percent. Yeah. So yeah. there's no temptation to do Malimoto. You want not, your camper at the end of the day. <laughs> not at, not at all. I don't want to be working on bikes the minute I get back till yeah. I, literally when I was there, I, I saw Kirsten, she was, I think they were all like pretty sick and, mm -hmm. Um, it's not the easiest thing. It's really not the easiest thing to race all day. Literally, I think up to uh, close to a thousand kilometers, yep. maybe 800 kilometers. And then if you've got some bike issues, you have to get back and, and work on your bike till whenever it's ready. You don't even have a time, like yep. whenever it's ready. And, uh, Charon this year actually had to change an engine and basically do it all by himself. Wow. It's, it's not the easiest thing. And then on top of that, go out the next day thinking, geez, did I tighten this bolt? Did I, did I do this? Did I do that? <laughs> you don't need so, that. No, you don't need when that. When you have to, I mean, you were telling me it's like you were given advice about how to sort of attack a dune or, you know, a point, like yeah, keep yeah. your eye on a, a spot, right? Or Yes. Yeah, yeah. So Ross actually told me that when you go into the dunes, you've got a, a cap heading of, of whatever. And um, you look as far as you can see and you kind of pick a pick a spot and that, that's where you kind of weave and left and right. And as long as you kind of in the direction of that spot, you'll kind of be on your cap heading. But now when you got to think about that, I tighten the back wheel, or the brakes <laughs> tight or whatever, it's, it's, no, no it's, it's difficult. It's not easy. So who are you taking with you then? My wife, uh, Chanel's coming okay. and then, um, Ke Kevin Tara from KTM, I'm okay. a mechanic that we have here. Okay. He's coming. So we use first stack car as well. So the three of us are all going to be rookies. <laughs> They're probably going to get lost between bivouac to bivouac, <laughs> but that's their problem. They go to camp to sleep and <laughs> I, I joke about this and Ray always laughs because, um, Hank Latran on the show was like, the first bit of advice he got was don't get lost. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Because this is a desert, man. It's not like uh, Google Maps uh, before whack number three, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, exactly. And in the desert, you're really small. When you're in the bottom of a bowl and you look around you and the, all you see is sand, you are really small. Yeah. You, but the getting lost part, hopefully it doesn't happen. 100% um, going to happen. Yeah. Um, just to to what degree and for how long is the question. And I imagine it's not a case of like, oh, that car's going that way. I must just follow him, right? Because he might no. look at you going, that car's going that way. He must be right. <laughs> that Exactly that. When you ride and you see you'll be lost and your buddy will be going that way and you think, no, no, he knows exactly where he's going and you end up following him and he's also lost. Then you forgot where you were or you, where you came from. or So, no, it is a difficult thing. And for some reason... 
you always think somebody else is right. Yeah. Like, oh, he's definitely going the right direction. Like, so I'll what just ha- follow him. What happens then? If you like you get lost, get do you lost have to circle back. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but do you circle back or what? You, like, I imagine going into your first Dakar, there's also a mental aspect here about trusting your gut, your equipment, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. That, that's what's really difficult as well. I don't have enough experience or I'm not experienced at all when it comes to the road book and, and making gut feeling decisions. Yeah. Like, I have to go based on. Like other yes, that's where I'm going. Or I, if it's not that, then I'm like, oh, I've got to find this. It's not. Yeah. So if you do get lost or you f- like unsure or whatever, the best thing that I've been told is to go back to where you were lost, certain of or previous checkpoint yeah. or waypoint yeah. or whatever the case may be. Um, but if that's 20 k's backwards, it's going to take you a while to get there, especially in the dunes, and it's um. Yeah, the best thing is to go back to where you knew, knew for certain yeah. and then turn around, stop, relax, try to figure out what's yeah, and, you and, and, and give it another go. You were telling me now you've just picked up your bike for the Dakar, right? Yeah, so wow. this, I was actually or, lucky enough I actually bought a bike, a rally okay. bike in South Africa, okay. and this is the bike I've been riding when we've been in Namibia and, yeah. and, and riding. So okay. I picked it up on Saturday from when we were in Namibia with Ross, uh, Charon and, and Stuart Gregory. Excuse my ignorance and no. my apologies, everyone. The difference between motocross bike setup and the rally bike setup, is it extremely different or is it like take some adjusting? I know like someone like Brad Binder was saying going from Moto2, you know, 3-2 and GP was huge because yeah. it just became a bigger beast really at the end yeah. of the day. Um, to be honest, the bike is, uh, the engine is a motocross 450 engine, okay. uh, a few different things inside, but the frame is like a, a rally version. So like a motocross bike mm. with a rally, uh, frame on it. And I think it's almost 28 liters of fuel that are in the is tanks. Is that enough fuel you. to uh, get, get you from A to B? <laughs> you get pretty far, but they also have, uh, f- fuel stops oh, okay. in the stage. Okay. So at 180 or 200 Ks or whatever the case may be. They worked it out that you need to stop and, and refuel. Okay. Um, but yeah, going back to the bike, it's, it is different, obviously. But um, at the end, there's a dirt bike. And when you're riding in the dunes and, and riding even on, even on a motocross track with the, the, the rally bike, it, you can feel it's, it's different, but it's yeah. not like, I would say, a Moto3 bike to MotoGP bike. It's motocross and off-road, and we don't really – feel the small things okay, like the yeah. road bike or yeah, the super yeah. bike, motor gp guy, yeah. bike guys do um so yeah for us it's it's more about just the feeling of the bike and not so much tire pressures and this and that because yeah. we just run a, a moose anyway so it's, yeah yeah it's uh, and i imagine someone has been so close to bikes his whole mm-hmm. life you get on and you get a feel like straight away like how this engine performs, you know, like just how the bike sits, how you sit on the bike, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, I know KTM. You've been with them for the longest of time, so yeah. it, it's a quality manufacturer. But you just have that feel from experience, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and also you have a bike that you gel with, and a bike you don't gel with. Like this, this year I actually my two cross country bikes had a, a race bike and a, and a practice bike and. For some reason, I didn't like the race bike. They're both exactly the same bikes. They were made in the same factory. They That's probably crazy. came off the same line behind <laughs> each other, but one felt like it was better and easier to ride, and the other one just felt like we were fighting each other. It's, That's crazy. It's a weird sense. Yeah. Like It's weird. But that's why I say it's a personal preference thing at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and the transition from motocross, cross country, you know, a little bit of – Everything you because you've raced. You said you raced. Was it Portugal? No, Morocco. Uh, uh, Mexico. 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 Yeah, Mexico. Yes. Yeah, something with an M. Yeah, yeah, close enough. <laughs> <laughs> Portugal and the M. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, but uh, Mexico. How how was that? Just to sort of get that international feel. If you know, I know motocross. You've done that, but this is a, a different beast altogether. Yeah, it was um, was was really cool. Um, the rally racing is a lot more relaxed, especially everyone comes back to Bovoac yeah. and it's a lot more relaxed than motocross, I feel. Um, the biggest thing for me is just kind of understanding how everything works. You've got time slots that you have to be waiting in line to get your, your road book. And 
say, let's say at half past six, you line up at 6.31, you pull forward, get your road book and 6.32, you head out onto the road yeah. and, and make your way to the start. Um, I think it was on day one, I went out, got my road book, got onto the road and went probably three, 400 meters, got to a road I thought I was supposed to turn out. I got lost, <laughs> stopped, waited, uh, got to the next road and it's not where I was supposed to be. So I had to go back around past the, the bivouac, wait for someone and I actually followed them in. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's not going to happen at Dakar, uh, don't no, worry. Let's hope not. Full confidence from that. <laughs> um, if you look back at your, your motocross career, like you obviously um, have won multiple times, that sort of thing, but do you have sort of a, a place you raced where you felt like, this is cool. Like, I love what I do. You, you know what I mean? Or a famous, a favorite track that you went back to. Um. Uh, I think it was in twin, in 2009, actually. I won the last round of the Canadian Championship. Um, it was at Walton Raceway. And I think that, that race was probably the most, I don't even know it's hard to explain, but the most calm, the most fun, the most... Like one, yeah, one of the most special days in my career, even though it was a long time ago, it, that feeling is still, I can almost feel it. Like yeah. it's, it was a really cool race and that whole weekend, because in Canada, the the, the last uh, national championship uh, race is like a week long, but not for the pros, for the amateur guys, they have this called the Walton Transcan, Transcan, however they say it. Okay. Um, so it's a week long kind of race for the amateurs and we race on, on the weekend on the, on the Sunday and that whole week was just really cool leading up to the race and that race, I'd won the, won the weekend before and then uh, winning the second weekend and at that track was, was pretty cool. When did you realize you need to leave South Africa to compete? Because within South Africa, obviously, We've, we've had some amazing motocross riders that have come through the ranks. I mean, I think um, Albertine, you know, these guys yeah, that yeah. have that have gone overseas and become huge stars overseas. Yeah. Is that something that was always in your your planning on your journey in, in the sport? Y yeah, it was. Um, I went to Europe when I was younger. I think it was like 16, so 2003, I think it was. I went to Europe and did a couple of races there. But Europe was never really my thing. Um I don't know why, I just didn't feel comfortable in Europe. I didn't feel, I think, the way everything worked, the language barrier, all that stuff. And probably also I didn't give it enough time. Um, I didn't go there for a full amount of time and stay there and, and become part of yeah. the process. Um, Which is not easy. I mean, at 16, are you kidding me? No, and, yeah, and like, that's that's the thing, though. A lot of guys actually did leave at that, that age. Yeah. Grant, Langston, uh, Albert Hain, he was young. Langston was young. Uh, Garrett, Tyler, Wyatt, they were yeah. all young when they left. So it was what you needed to do. I just didn't do it for long enough. I didn't stick it out and go back. Or yeah. So Europe was not really my thing, but it was the way to go back then. Yeah. Um, and I think it still is. We have some really good GP riders at the moment, uh, Cameron McClellan and um, Calvin Flandrin. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I just didn't stick it out like they all did. And I kind of back and forward. And then in 06, I won uh, the MX2 Championship here. And then I actually wanted to go to the US in 07. But then we got speaking to a couple of guys and they actually knew some people in Canada, um, some South Africans, uh, Sal and Momberg. And I went and stayed with them. They were kind enough to open the house to me. And I went and stayed there. And uh, Yamaha yeah, actually sent me a bike to, to Canada. And I raced a South African bike there and then sent it back home. And then, uh, yeah, kind of snowballed from there. And then I was on Honda and then been on KTM since 09. Did you, was it a, sort of a, a journey of self-discovery in a way? Packing your bags, heading to Canada. You know, I mean... It's not easy to leave your your home, your people, no, no. and then to go to a place that is millions of miles away. Essentially, yeah. it feels like that. It feels like it, yeah. Um, yeah. And to say, well, I actually have to pitch up and perform. Yeah, yeah, and and also it's also really difficult. Like, you get to a new country, you don't really know anyone, and I was, I'm really grateful. The Canadian people in general are really, really nice people. They helpful. They there's nothing. 
no task too big to help with. So I was really fortunate that the people were really nice. And um, when I arrived there, I basically had nothing. I didn't have a car, I didn't have anything. And obviously the Mombergs, they helped out a lot. And then another South African was there that I had known racing, through racing, Richard Chater. And then I eventually connected up with him and, and we kind of went riding and stuff together and then eventually moved moved in with him. And then, yeah, still just traveling back and forward and, and not really having transport or, yeah. or anything. And the Canadian people helped out a lot. And then 09, we actually bought our own camper. And then me and another South African, uh, Liam O'Farrell, we traveled the basically the whole of Canada together. Oh, that's awesome. So that was really cool. 09 was a, a really cool season and we rode for the same team. So it was him and I and uh, my mom came in the beginning for... I think three three months or something, and um, yeah, we just traveled Canada, and that place is really cool. It's massive. <laughs> yeah, uh, beautiful, massive place. Yeah, uh, I'm hoping to go in January for a oh, nice. particular yeah. fight that's happening in Toronto, yeah. Drickus and uh, Sean Strickland. Um, so yeah, I'll get some advice uh, <laughs> on Toronto, but I, I would like to know that that sort of that journey through through Canada did that shape you as to who you are today? I mean father um you're part of the business you're embarking on this new chapter you're a, a legend of south african motocross um did it shape you in, in a way um i think in some way obviously I had a massive role in who i am today and and where i am today um liam actually ended up he's now living in canada he's married with also two kids and he's living in canada and his first year i think it was 08 or yeah, oh eight. Um, so yeah, I, I do think obviously it's shaped me into somewhat of who I am today. Um, but yeah, I think racing in general has kind of made me who I am and and put me on a path. I'll yeah. probably, I probably would not be a normal person if I didn't race. To be honest, <laughs> <laughs> we can get into that if you want. <laughs> but uh, what do you miss? Uh, of the motocross side and, and we'll move into um, the new chapter in in a moment. But what do you miss on that, that motocross? Because I imagine it's once the lights out, you hell for leather through that, trying to get in front, trying yep. not to get bashed and knocked over and crashed and that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, that exactly like I miss the, the competitive side of it. Not that I'm saying cross country and, and rally is not yeah. competitive, but I miss that high intensity kind of, um, Everyone's on the gate. You all start together. Like you say, you try and make it through the first turn, first two, three turns without getting taken out or ridden into. or um, And that intensity of, of someone being right there the whole time. Um, it's, I love like competition. Um, not that I'm a, I don't say I'm a competitive person outside of racing a bike, yeah. but when I'm racing, I love competition. I love that feeling of competing and, and trying to be the best. How, how would you sum up the South African scene at the moment? Because it's not the cheapest sport no. to get into. Uh, it's a dangerous sport. Let's not kid ourselves. I mean, I'm no. sure you've broken a few bones. Uh, I have, but I have been really lucky. Um, but I think uh, a lot of people do say it is dangerous and it is dangerous, but we live in South Africa. No, fair enough. <laughs> Driving on the road is dangerous, <laughs> let alone. Absolutely. No, and I think there are protocols in place and yeah, yeah. there's equipment and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. It's hell of a fun at the same time. Yeah, it is. And, and it's like, it's just you, just you out there racing against 10, 20, 30 other guys. It's uh, the performance at the end of the day when you cross the finish line. I think with all motorsports is as much as you have a great team behind you and a lot of people supporting you, um, they can all be there and, and give you everything you need. But at the end of the day, it, it, it's on you to do well, yeah. to win or, or a fight back from a bad start or whatever the case may be. So that's also a cool aspect of it. Um, but going back to your question on how the sport is in South Africa at the moment, it is... We have some really good riders. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, they had the Motocross of Nations this year, um, and the guys did really well. Um, considering what we get to race on our tracks and um, the learning curve that you have to take coming from South Africa 
to a, an international race like the motocross of nations is massive yeah. like the tracks are way more difficult there's it's either pouring with rain which we don't get much of the guys don't get to to spend much time in the rain um deep sand we have one one sand track i mean pe is sandy but when you compare it to lommel or somewhere in the netherlands it's not sandy at all yeah. and then their hard pack tracks are really deep ruts across the whole track that we don't really get so for the guys to go and compete and and race against the best in the world and this year at the des nations in france they did really well considering what they have to adapt to in a short space of time and in one day i mean you captain the team right you well yeah, yeah, yeah i mean i, I would never no, look seven at myself, years ago yeah, no, <laughs> yeah i never look at myself as the captain of the team yeah. but i mean i had gone to a few and and yeah, we kind of had bad luck every time I was there, but it's what it is. Yeah, but what an experience. Representing South Africa in motocross, are you kidding me? Yeah, it was really cool. And South Africa is such a small racing community. Like you say, we've produced some really good riders and we've done really well mm. in the motocross world. No, I think we can be very proud. And, and let's yep. see what someone like Hamden can do. You know, yep. uh, he's an ex incredibly exciting young talent. Yep. I know yep. they've moved to Belgium or they're in Europe somewhere and yes, doing yeah. good things. So let's keep an eye on them. But as I say, there's a few youngsters that we must definitely pay attention to. Yep. I don't think the sport gets enough love, but yeah, no, I mean, factors. It, is, it, <laughs> it is what it is. But uh, yeah, it's. I think they'll they'll do well. Yeah. Um, Speaking of which, I mean, of talent, obviously you and, and Brad and Darren go way back. Um, and you probably <coughs> look at me each time, you see me like, oh, is he going to ask me about Brad again? <laughs> Who's Brad? <laughs> <laughs> but um, Brad and Darren Binder have done phenomenally well. Uh, Brad in particular. I know you were at his wedding just the other day. Yep. Um, but what makes Brad, in your opinion, such, a, such an incredible rider? Because he's so level-headed and such a humble guy whenever i've had to interact with him over the years since when he was in moto three when he won the world championship yep. there um he's just a great ambassador for us no 100 percent. i think it's obviously he's a a tough competitor he yeah. wants to win i think at the end of the day regardless of how he is off the off the bike he wants to win when the helmet's on and um but off the bike he's a, a really good guy i think he's yeah, he's he's a really really good guy, down to earth. He's got time for time for everybody. Um, there's never a day really where you won't stop and take a photo with someone. When we're at the track, at the motocross track or whatever, he gets bombarded most of the time with kids. They've probably had a photo with him the Wednesday before as well, but they want another <laughs> one, and you'll happily happily do it. And I think he's quite a determined guy. Um, my brother helps him out with their training stuff, and. He's quite like strict with himself, mm. I think. He does whatever he's either asked or what he feels is right. He <clears throat> sticks to his schedule and, yeah. and does what he needs to do. And I think that translates into to him being so good on the bike. It's, he's disciplined off the bike and, and obviously really disciplined on the bike and knows what he wants from from the bike and what he needs. Do, do you think the, the sprint format – you think he, he's enjoying that? I know he won in Argentina, but it is an interesting addition to, I know Formula One's done it, yeah. uh, but with MotoGP now, that sprint race on the Saturday is, is quite riveting. Yeah. And Brad is always, or he's been known as a Sunday man. Yeah. yeah. Um, but how, how do you, uh, how do you view it? Because you're so close to the guy, you know, it, it for me, it's, it's just adds more racing. It's great to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, to be honest, I don't really talk to him too much about the racing. Um, I think sometimes it's the last thing he wants to talk about. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> um, but as a racer, I think there's two sides to that. Um, for them, they already race so much. Now to add basically another round of racing at throughout the at the championship is quite a bit of racing. Sure. And on top of that, you how many rounds are there in MotoGP? It's 18. Like 18, yeah. So it's 36 so, I mean, races. 36 races. Yeah. And then you're also adding 18 chances of another crash or something enough. something going so wrong. Free so, practice and, and qualifying. Exactly. So there's a lot that kind of, I think they would maybe look at as pros and cons, but sure. obviously more track time for the, the spectators and the fans is, that's cool for us. Yeah. But as a race, I'm sure some of them love it and some of them don't like it too much. Would you be tempted to get on 
the sort of road and do some. Have, I'm sure you've been around the track. On the yeah, road. I actually wanted to race road bikes when I was much younger, but my mom she said it was too dangerous. I don't know. I don't know how she found out or thought motocross would be safer <laughs> than road bikes. But I actually wanted to race road bikes. But looking back now, I had a did a couple of laps not too long ago, and I'm happy I stuck to motocross. Already. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 I mean, I know MotoGP is like 343, 350Ks an hour, yeah, which yeah. just blows my mind. Crazy, crazy. You know, like, what's your top speed there that did you actually look and say like, oh um, my goodness, this is, <laughs> this is pretty fast or? No, I, I, I can't really remember, but it would be pretty hard, but obviously nothing in the 300. Sure, is, sure. Is, but, um. The problem is you look down and you think, hey, I'm going pretty fast. Next moment you look up and there's a corner coming at you. And <laughs> yeah, I've got to do something here. <laughs> yeah, I've got to do something, others. I'm ending up in the kitty litter. <laughs> um, but no, it's road racing is, uh, it looks so easy and relaxing, but yeah. it's really not. It's, I think, quite a demanding sport the mentally. Limits, yeah, exactly. And you know, you got to break here every time and you got to try to pass someone, you got to break past that and still make the turn. It's, it's, a, it's a very technical sport, yeah. I think. I think that's why, like, whenever I watch even the Moto3 guys, I'm like, these guys are cowboys. They are insane. Eh? It's a uh, new level of respect for them. <laughs> um, moving ahead now to your, your Dakar preparations, what what have you been? I know you've spent time in Namibia. Yep. Um, am I allowed to tell them where you been sort of riding yeah, 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 in yeah. Sasselberg. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, you know, yeah, I mean, because your fans are going to rock up there now. <laughs> no, yeah, look for you guys. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, we, <laughs> I've been trying to, trying to ride as much as possible. Yeah. Like I said earlier, I was fortunate enough that the riding comes a little bit easier than sure. obviously the like, navigation thing is, is really difficult. Um, How do you even prepare for that? Because I'm like, it, it also blows my mind a little bit going, okay, this is route one, we're going five January, got to go. X amount of Ks, you've got to make sure you hit all these waypoints or, or whatever they are. How do you practice for that? Yo, and you get the route the night before or on the morning or something? On the morning. So now we, we got electronic road books. So obviously, yeah. I don't know how that's going to work in terms of getting the getting the route. Yeah. Um, but in Mexico, and I think with all the rallies for the last year or two years or whatever, you basically get the road book 20 minutes before the start. So you get a road book from the bivouac to the, to the start. And then you tear that book out, you throw that one away, and then uh, you go into that like waiting process, and you get another another road book twenty minutes before you start, and you got to roll it in. Some guys mark it and and have certain ways of looking at the road book to yeah. kind of show them the dangers or the cautions or whatever they do. Um, so basically, they get it 20, 20 minutes before the race, and and you set off into the unknown, unknown, and hopefully. All works out. I'm sure it will. But still, it's just incredible to think. I, I've got to ask you, I mean, when you roll up to that starting line, little starting line, I suppose, and you've got your your route and this is where we're going to go, what do you think is going to go through your mind? Because I always find it quite interesting, especially with uh, athletes who have performed at such a high level, mentally you know where you need to be when you're sitting on the bike and ready to go, regardless of it's the cross country, the the motocross or, or the rally stuff, mentally you need to have sort of be in a good space in your head. Your body needs to feel good, but there's always this anticipation and, and almost nerves that sometimes will come to the fore. I know there's athletes who physically get ill before an event because yep. they're so nervous. Um, what do you think is going to be going through your, your mind at that point in time? Just, this is, a great experience, an opportunity, or yeah, I, I don't know. To be honest with you, I, I'm I'm like a pretty relaxed guy. Yeah, I've never really suffered from anxiety, nervous issues, kind of on race day. Um, but I, I don't know. To be honest with you, I'm. I just, I don't know. I, I'll probably just want to race and yeah. try to go as fast as I can, but also know that there's some some dangers out there that will will catch you so i think for the first couple of days i'm definitely going to try to play it safe yeah. and get through get through those days and then after that see see how we go and then try try race i imagine also the when you hit your first waypoint it's a huge confidence boost you know and you haven't 
you haven't crashed yet or anything like you know you know what I mean? Yeah, like it's yeah, yeah. baby steps. Like yeah, it no, really no, hundred percent. And also like um Ross Branch, uh, Brad, Sharon Moore, Stuart Gregory, they've all helped me so much in this like step towards kind of doing rally. Mm. Um they obviously Ross is one of the best in the world and Charon won Malamoda and his navigation is is really good. Um so yeah having or having done all of that, it it does kind of give me a little peace of mind going into the race. Um but so I have no idea what to expect. Mm. I have no idea of where I'm gonna be in terms of results. I know where I would like to be or would wanna be, but I have no idea. Um yeah. it's like I don't know what to expect. I, I, yeah. yeah, it really is uncharted waters. It's, no, 100%. It's exciting. I mean, I'm not even racing. I'm getting excited here. <laughs> um, but I think also once you've ticked that box, I'm sure there's a few more. I mean, you get guys, I think Janil's what? Was he? 20th, this one, I think. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's mad. I think, he, I think he might even hold the record or might break the record or something because I think he started 20 and he's finished. Or oh, if he finishes can set, in yeah. 24, he's, he's finished mad, 20. Eh? Twenty there, because I may be wrong, but when I was there last year, I think he was talking about it or something. Yeah, so, I mean the guy's an absolute legend. Yeah, so. that's insane. Twenty of them is. But I crazy. suppose it's a hunger thing. It's about a desire to compete, to go out and test yourself, but also test yourself against other top quality competitors. Yeah, and I think also going back, like that guy I spoke about earlier, Neville Bradshaw. He's 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 raced his whole life as well, and. We've spoken a little bit of, of kind of like if we had to stop and whatnot, but I think racing almost makes you a better person outside of racing. We kind of won't get that that fix that we kind of long for, look for anywhere else. And who knows what will happen if you don't get that luck, like how you would become. But I think racing keeps us more sane than it keeps us crazy or yeah. however you want to look at it. But racing definitely is better for us than it is us not racing. Absolutely. Physically, I mean, what are you kind of expecting there? Because, yes, concentration levels have to be at 100 and whatever percent. Uh, but physically also, it's not like it's one day and you're done. No. It's putting them back to back, back to back. Yeah. So, I mean, the shakes on the bike, the vibrations, <laughs> you know, have you got a nice sheepskin uh, seat or something like yeah, that? I need like, one of those. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what I mean from a from a physical point of view. Also, uh, this is going to be next level. No, no, of course, yeah. And I think, like you say, the sheepskin seat. I think if there was something I've heard guys sit on, like donuts and stuff, because it's to sit on a seat that's this wide for eight hundred kilometers a day for thirteen days or fourteen yeah. days in a row, it, your ass does get a bit raw <laughs> yeah. after after a while. But I think it's one of those things you just kind of do it yeah it's it has to be done it's been done before so there's no reason why you can't do it it's just how much pain you're willing to endure in, in that period of time but yeah i'm i'm looking forward to all of it in some weird way i, th I think it's just because this is a new chapter and i think what you've achieved in the other disciplines if i can put it that were categories of racing um i think there'll be quite a few people quite keen to see how you go are you sort of aware of the the eyeballs that'll be on you because of what you've achieved in South African motorsport? Um, no, not really. I don't really think about okay. that kind of stuff. It's it's not. I mean, coming from South Africa, it's quite small, so it's not something that usually happens. But um, no, I just want to go race and have fun, um, enjoy the journey, and and do it do it while I can. I think that's yeah. What I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I wish you all the best. I, I've no doubt that it's going to be quite the adventure for you and, and you'll do us all very proud. When you cross that finish line, do you think it's going to be like a, a, a ton of emotion? Because you come across as some guy who's quite sort of comfortable in his own skin. He's not phased by much. But there comes a point when you achieve something that everyone feels the emotion of it. Do you think it's going to be like... Oh my goodness, I just finished the Dakar and there's going to be a few tears or I know there's going to be beers, but <laughs> yeah, no, we're actually in Saudi, you're not allowed to drink. So <laughs> yeah, but fair enough. When you, when you're done, though, yeah, you know no, what I'm no, saying, I think but. definitely when you come home, we'll have a, a little bit of a get together, but, um, maybe, 
Uh, yeah. Depends, I think, also on how I do. If I, if I put around for 12 or 13 days, I'm not going to be very happy at the end. Um, <laughs> True. So, <laughs> yeah. so I think if I, if I do well and, and everything goes quite well, then maybe. But even with championships in the past, I've never really shown emotion. Mm. It's, I, um, it's what I s kind of set out to do it at the beginning of that year. And I feel like maybe I would have more emotion if it was a surprise. Sure. But I think if you set out to do something and you accomplish what you're wanting to do, then it's basically you've kind of worked for that and yeah. it is what it is. Um, would you be tempted to try it on four wheels at some point? I, I know because uh, with a motorbike, you can see a lot. You yeah, know, I don't yeah, know how much yeah. you can see in a car, <laughs> although no. you've got a bit more protection, you know. Yeah, but I, I don't think that driving a car in the dunes is the easiest thing and especially not racing, racing it. Um, when we're in Namibia now, the guys were saying in the car, you literally, you go up a dune and all you see is blue sky and the tip of the dune and you go down, all you see is sand and dune going down and when you're cresting the dunes, you can't really see when you crest oh, it. And man. So I don't think it's the easiest thing, but of course I would like to get in a car and give it a go, but I'll probably end up on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> Kieran, uh, I want to wish you all the best, man. Thanks for coming in and spending time with us and sharing. We could speak for hours, yep. um, but my executive producer is like, you got a time limit here. <laughs> uh, I just want to say, you know, uh, all the best. Be safe out there. And yeah, we, we're all behind you, man. I know what you said, eight South Africans on bikes or? Southern Southern Africans. Africans? Yeah, okay. I think there's uh, obviously Ross is Botswana and South Africa. We claim him, right? Yeah, we'll claim him. Like we'll Federer. Claim Ross, we yeah. claim him. Like Roger <laughs> yeah. Federer. <laughs> and then there's Ash Thixton. Okay. Um, Ronald Fenter, uh, Michael Doherty. He lives in the UAE. Um, Brad, myself, Ross, Sharon. Um, and then obviously I saw us. Something that over half the cars in, in the Dakar are built in South Africa as well. It's amazing. Um, so, yeah, it's basically it should be the South African rally, not the Dakar rally. <laughs> doesn't have the same ring to no, it, it though. Doesn't. No, it no, doesn't. No, no, no. <laughs> anyway, Kerem, thank you so much. Have a wonderful festive season. Um, and, yeah, we're all behind you, man. Go and do us proud out in Dakar. Yeah, thanks, yes. Thanks for your time. And uh, same to you and your family. Have a, a great December and New Year. Yeah, I certainly won't be preparing for Dakar. Maybe to watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Yeah, anyway, it's one of those. But thanks very much for watching. Please like and subscribe. And once again, big shout out to our partners at Betway. Check out betway.co.za for more. Have a great festive season and we'll see you next time.